hang on just a second. <laughs> and for some reason, during that brief bit of confusion, I lost my monitor. Very strange. All right, hang on. I'll be with you in a minute. I hate to think how much I just messed you all up by um, changing titles midstream. Right, right before I was about to start broadcasting, I went, "Oh no!" I put the. I described. I described my process wrongly. Anyway, sorry about that. If it caused any kind of confusion on your feed there. Uh, so the name of this broadcast is. Uh, pencil lines and blank daily art adventure 846 that's the important part <laughs> uh, pencil lines and um, let's see if let's see if I get a hello crystalline good I do have a monitor back all right let me move this just for a minute so you can see the painting such as it is for crystalline and others who watched me either yesterday or the day before um, all the acrylics are done of course uh, then I did a without your company can you believe it the nerve of some people <laughs> to work without your without your presence it's painful but it has to be done sometimes so uh, without you looking glazed just this morning the whole Whole painting. Hello, Uncle. Good to have you here. And I've lost my monitor again. That is so strange. Hang on just a minute, folks. There might, there might be something wrong with the particular monitor I'm using, so I'll switch to a different one. Glaze and is remarkably close to finished. There are just a couple things that I want to do to it. Well, <laughs> generally speaking, the most important layer is the final edit. But honestly, because I did un a little bit unusual, I did so much careful drawing in the acrylic phase way back in the acrylics that I happily have less to do now in... Um, in this phase and forgive me i am changing in monitors i know you guys don't care what i've got in my ear but um it helps me a great deal because it helps me to know lets me know if for some reason i suddenly stop broadcasting and i can go i can go on jabbering to myself for minutes and minutes and minutes on end without realizing that I'm not broadcasting. So that's one of the things that this in-ear contraption does for me. I get to hear myself, <laughs> like it or not, I get to hear myself say everything twice. Can you imagine? It's painful enough hearing it the first time, let alone hearing it twice. I glazed it with uh, the normal, Uncle, uh, liquid. Thanks for asking. Uh, because it, this, that was my first, my first glaze. So there was no need to be uh, careful and, you know, about speed of drying. Because uh, everything underneath it is acrylic. So I'm well within the s s margin of safety. As you all know, you want fast dry underneath and slow dry on top. You, it just makes logical sense. You, you do not want underneath layers of your painting drying before your top layers are dry, right? That's where the old-fashioned mantra, fat over lean, came from. But uh, that mantra is now quite uh, misleading. 
that, that mantra, fat over lean, worked when pretty much everybody was using like linseed oil or something like that because that was that that meant that you were doing a a slow dry on top of medium or dry okay but that is not the case anymore many many of us use all different kinds of mediums that do not slow down the drying but in fact speed it up so then the mantra fat over lean is very confusing the new mantra is must be uh, slow dry over fast dry or vice versa the other way around um, um, check him having a hard time getting it up other way around which is fast dry first slow dry second or last there you go Whew, got it out whoops I have an incoming call it's the other thing that my monitor does for me Good, and I will certainly ignore that telemarketer. <laughs> um, all right, so let's talk about painting, uh, or in this case, drawing. Um, for you regulars, this is plain old, plain old, plain old. You've seen it uh, many times, but in case there's somebody new watching, first of all, no, it is, you do not <laughs> if you want to be a traditional painter, you most certainly do not um, use pencils in oil paintings, okay? So I, I always have visions of, you know, some, some high school art kid watching my broadcast. Not that anybody like that watches, but oh, sure, so once in a while. Anyway, going, you know, going back to school and starting to use, or college student for that matter, and, and pulling out a pencil and starting drawing on their oil painting and their teacher or professor having a cow saying, nine, nine, nine. <laughs> no, you don't, you don't use pencils in an oil painting for goodness sake. All right, so just understand, this is very unconventional. You may get in trouble with your teacher if you try doing this. You have to explain first, well, I saw this weird guy online named Dan Nelson, who actually does a whole bunch of drawing right in the middle of his, of his oil painting. I've told this story many times, but it's been a while, it's been a little while since I told it. So let me tell you, how did I get started doing pencils? And the pencils I'm using again, just for review. Um, can you see that Jumbo Jet Black distributed by Jerry's Autorama? All right, they're out by the way, <laughs> they're on back order. And be careful, the next batch that comes is coming straight from China. <laughs> that, that thought did hit my mind. It struck me the, uh, last week when I was in the uh, art store and they said, no, they're on back order and we won't get any more till March something. And I thought, yeah, and they're coming right off a boat from, slow boat from China. Anyway, I'm not really recommending panic. I might be, in spite of what I just said, I might be, re I might be recommending caution, <laughs> a thought. <laughs> anyway, just for what it's worth. All right, so how did I get started? Oh, and before I go on, some of you are saying, wait a minute, you're using a red pencil. Okay, my, I'm, I'm interrupting myself here. Okay, I'm using a red pencil as a complete ex experiment. This is a watercolor pencil. And before I started this broadcast, just a little while ago, because um, I've been thinking about this for a while, I just haven't done it. So I, I did a little experiment. I made a few marks on this painting with with this red watercolor pencil and then I brushed liquid on it and the effect was quite satisfactory the liquid will in in essence um, I'm, I'm putting the red pencil down for a minute the red pencil I mean the 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 uh, liquid will in essence turn the red pencil into oil paint 
when it, the, the, the liquid will seal the red pencil and then it will behave like, like oil paint. I'm, why? Because, well, there's a little bit of waxy, which is oil-based medium, in right there in the uh, red pencil already. So oil-based, oil-based, no problem. I guess some of you are confused. I thought it was a watercolor pencil. It is, it is. But they have to use a binder in the watercolor to hold, make it into a pencil. And the binder is almost certainly what is typically called a wax base. They don't use the term oil, but oil wax, essentially the same thing. All right, now, let me uh, go back to what I was going to try to say, what got me started. I'll talk in a minute about why I use uh, pencils in my oil paintings. But right now, I'll just talk about how I started. And it's receding into the depths of history, so I don't, I don't know when it happened. It was, I think, I think the summer of 2016, so three and a half years ago. Um, and it was just a season that I was going through. It was great fun. I didn't know, I haven't repeated it since, but in that summer, I did a whole bunch of abstract paintings. Like, like when I say a whole bunch, I mean like nearly, I think I did 200 abstract paintings in 2016, most of them in the summer. Half of them, 100 paintings. <laughs> okay, I don't know if I want to open this can of worms or not. But I did uh, 100 abstract paintings in one four-day weekend. I did indeed. I have yet to release um, a video that I am going, I'm, I will eventually, I just haven't got around to it, an edited video where I s brag a little bit. <laughs> no, not you, Mr. Dan. You would never brag <laughs> about anything. No, no, say it ain't so. <laughs> Thank you for noticing. I'm very famous for my humility. <laughs> Anyway, um, I did a hundred abstract paintings one weekend, partly just to show that I, just because I'm a something, something, something. <laughs> the words B, O, and S <laughs> come to mind in, in a different order. <laughs> um, <laughs> just to show that I could. All right, so in the, <laughs> boy, in the summer of 2016, I uh, did a whole bunch of abstract paintings. And it was while I was doing abstract paintings, I just sort of went through my drawers of tools, right? Art tools, and saw these pencils and said, huh, that might be kind of fun. Let's use these pencils in my abstract paintings. So that's what I did. So, Because you can imagine, I think you can, anybody can understand that when you're doing abstract stuff, you know, you're a little bit more free because you don't have the pressure and constraints of trying to draw stuff or render stuff so you can just you're just focused really focused on making interesting marks so that's what happened I started using these um, pencils in my abstract paintings and lo and behold whoop noise hang on that's the other reason I wear in here. Uncle 60, bless your heart. Beer money, I need it. I'm hoping it's okay if I turn it into margarita money. But I won't get as many, but <laughs> I'll enjoy a lot more. Thank you, my friend. You're too kind. I appreciate that very much. The rest of you, I'm not telling you have to do it, but I'm just letting you know that what Uncle 60 just did is gave me a super chat contribution, which you can do too as soon as you begin to appreciate my generosity and my humility. My humility and my generosity. <laughs> All right, so, so I started using pencils about three and a half years ago uh, in abstract and enjoyed it so much that I thought, doggone, well, maybe I should start using um, pencils in my regular painting, my representational stuff. So I did. So I sort of, I sort of tiptoed into this business 
of, of using pencils. And at first, like, okay, so I, like, like you, I hope, I'm always evolving as an artist. I'm always trying new things. I'm always experimenting. I hope you're doing that too. But at first, I wasn't at all sure. I said, I don't know, I'm, I'm using pencils. Maybe it's just a passing fancy. And I still have to say that because I may evolve. You know, in five years, I might slap my head and say, what was I thinking? That was so stupid, visually stupid. I don't mean, you know, like, man, I, I shouldn't have been using pencils and blah, blah, blah. Do you understand? And, and I have no idea if that's, I sort of doubt it though. Anyway, so I gingerly tiptoed into using pencils. And you can see, I hope, just by <laughs> looking at what I just did in the last few minutes, what I like, and go back to red for in one hand for a minute, what I like about the pencils. I, I, it's, a, it's a visual. It's just, I like the way skinny, scratchy, dark lines, the way they look next to smushy paint. If I can call the paint smushy, and I call the pencils scratchy. I like the juxtaposition of smushy and scratchy together, right? Um, since I've gone this far into it, I'll finish the story a little bit. And, and so there's a long period where I didn't know if I would continue. As a matter of fact, not only has it continued, it's actually increased my use, my, the, the, the weight that I put on my pencil lines has has increased not diminished so there you go so so far i'm liking it and there were uh, two galleries ironically one was in north carolina and one was in scottsdale arizona and i was standing as looking like like we all do <laughs> looking at somebody else's artwork and uh, in both cases there were there was a some abstract painters in in a bin and twice this happened to me, that um, I started looking at a, an artist, an abstract artist, who also used, I don't know what kind of pencils, but it, it looked like, the lines looked very much like this, black lines, and uh, they, both artists used pencils in some of their paintings and not in other other paintings. Get it? So it was an artist and two different artists in two different galleries and two different ends of the country. It was just ironic that I happened to be in visiting our son in Scott in Arizona. And um, so I looked at these two different artists work. Some some of their work had pencil in it and some did not. And you know what? This was the, the biggest encouragement in this direction. In both cases, I preferred their pieces in which they did use the pencil. In both cases, like, oh man, their pencil stuff's better. And, and there were paintings, and they were oil paintings or, oil, or acrylic, I don't know which. Anyway, so that was a, a, a big boost of encouragement to me because it made, it would help me to be very objective and look at somebody else's completely unrelated to me, somebody else's work and go, golly. Their work's better when they use a pencil. So that, anyway, so I've been using it ever since. And again, I already said why, just because I, like I like the way the scratchiness and the smooshiness interact with each other on the canvas. So there you go. Purely visual. Of course, you're welcome to try it, of course. You might try and go, yeah, it works for Dan Nelson, but it doesn't work for me. Of course, that's, you know, that's what you're supposed to do as an artist, so to speak. You see somebody else that does something, say, oh, huh, I should give that a try. And then you do, and sometimes you go, nah, good for them, doesn't work for me. Or other times you go, yeah, it does work for me, and you don't have to name it after me or anything. <laughs> the Dan Nelson Memorial Pencil Technique. <laughs> Don't call it that yet, because I'm happy to report I'm not dead yet. So, no memorials needed. <laughs> I would hope that you're discerning here, 
as I'm drawing and as you look at what I'm drawing, um, that careful um, replication or careful, fastidious, accurate, tight drawing is clearly not my highest value, right? Um, because if it is, I'm doing a really poor job. <laughs> because as you can see, my, my pencil lines are quite erratic, wiggly, abstract, or as I normally like to say, interesting. Let me zoom in again just at what I've done on the last couple of minutes. So this is a tree. And, and again, this is the first time I've used red. I've thought about it a bunch. Now I may, I may expand in days, weeks, months to come. I may expand to a whole bunch of other colors. And I thought about doing that even this morning. Then I thought, no, Red is unique, every color is unique, but, but, but in, in this regard, um, anyway, I'm, I think I'm only, I think I'm only going to use red in this drawing, not, I'm not going to uh, branch out, although I can imagine, I, like, another, the next color I might use would be so, actually some kind of green, maybe even a, Oh, a viridian or a, even a bright aqua. Anyway, who knows? Who knows? And I don't know. This may be a red letter day. This might be, hello, light blue. <laughs> Good to have you with us again. Um, this might be the last time I use red. Or this might be, you know, maybe I should write this down in my, in my uh, journal, in my diary. Dear diary, today I used red pencils for the first time. See, that's what I did not do. 10, 12, 15 years ago when I started painting with two hands. Um, I didn't write it down, so I have no idea. I can go back in my videos. I, my earliest YouTube video, I think, is 2011, so that's nine years ago, and I was painting with two hands. Um, and, and I doubt that that was the first time I painted with two hands. In fact, I'm sure it wasn't, so whatever. So I might decide using red pencils is a bad idea. I'm open to your input, by the way. Joker, you re message, retracting a lot of messages. <laughs> Hello, Vesely, Vesely Cindy. Good to have you on board as well. Oh, somebody from Washington, D.C. is calling me. I'm not kidding. My caller ID just gave a number from Washington, D.C. Like, tell me that's not a telemarketer. <laughs> or tell a something. I don't get, I do not get political phone calls. But my wife does. My wife is a lot more politically active than I am. I think I kind of like the red. You know, I'm, I'm trying to sort of keep a balance, you know, between the, the red. All right, just so did you see that mark that I just made right there? Was I, oh, was I off screen? Oh, I was almost off. Okay, well, you can see the mark that I made. I'm sorry, I'll keep going. Anyway, that was one of those, I usually describe it as, uh, in my painting, I give my hand, hands in my case, permission to have little seizures. I don't know how, that's the best way to describe it, without my permission. In other words, I give my, I give my hands essentially a loose rein to, to do stuff on their own without me thinking about it. Now that's very intuitive and not technically correct, but I'm trying to describe things that are very intuitive and, and Okay, I just did one there. It was a little more. It's, it's like if I try to think about it ahead of time, it won't work. Uh, it'll just uh, mess up. But um, 
if it happens spontaneously, then it usually looks pretty good. Where my, again, where, where I give my hand permission to do these completely abstract marks and even big ones like that or that. Now, both of those, was I on camera? No, I wasn't, once again, sorry. Okay, so I just, you saw my arm move, but I just made this mark with black and this one with red. Okay, big, just big curves. Um, they do not, I don't, think I, need, I don't think I need to explain this, but they do not indicate or reflect anything realistic in the scene. You know, it's not like there's a power line or a kite string or anything like that up there in the sky, nothing of the sort. It's purely abstract. Likewise. And again, I, those kind of marks, for me, need to come unbidden, un, unpremeditated, unplanned. If I try to plan them, they come off as contrived, forced. And again, a very awkward, very difficult to de explain or describe that. And I guess you would, more technically speaking, um, I don't know that I'm going to do that until a split second before it happens. And I do have the capacity, the decision-making process, like, like that right there, um, to either rein it in withhold it and say, no, 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 that'd be a bad idea right now. Or to let her rip, so to speak. And most of the time I let her rip. And most of the time I'm happy that I did. But again, um, very intuitive, very defies analysis almost. You know, I, I, a, cor a parallel just came to mind, very strange. But I'll give it to you anyway. So I'm trying to describe what it's like to be a spontaneous, uh, okay, there, I just made another one. What it's like to be a spontaneous artist. My, man, my right hand just made another small. Um, okay, all of that, spontaneous. Um, when I was a young man, which I was for quite a long time, um, <laughs> I don't know what happened. <laughs> Something happened. We raised a bunch of kids, turned around one day and said, golly, while we've been raising kids, we turned old. That's sort of what happens. Anyway, when I was a young man, um, I, was, I did a lot of cartooning. Professionally, um, back in the late 70s and early 80s, I was moderately well-known, that might be putting it too exaggeratedly, nah, moderately, slightly well-known, okay, slightly well-known around the country as a cartoonist. I did not have a, I was a commercial cartoonist. I did not have a comic strip, for goodness sake. No, no, that's a different, completely different um, career path. I was a commercial artist. I was a freelance illustrator, and a lot of the work that I did included cartooning. So, um, and a lot of Americans would have seen my cartoons somewhere, but they would have seen them on a, well, I, a couple experiences stick out in my mind. So I lived in, after 1989, I lived, my, we lived in North Carolina, and uh, sometime in the early 90s, I believe it was, we were visiting my parents in Michigan, which is where I grew up, small town, middle of Michigan, near Lansing, and uh, I walked around the corner to a 7-Eleven store or some convenient mart like that to buy something and walked up to the front door of the convenience store and there on the front of, on the door with one of those clear plastic stickers, you know, they stick on windows, was uh, one of my cartoons. You know, Coca-Cola or Freezy Pops or who knows what. But anyway, that, that was, that was kind of fun, frankly. That, that was quite a, quite fun. We, you know, we, we would see my cartoons around North Carolina a fair amount, but it was quite fun to be 500 miles away and see one. So that kind of thing did happen. I used to tell my kids um, that I'm really famous, just nobody knows it. <laughs> anyway, so I was a cartoonist and 
I began doing cartoons when I was 10 years old. And so when you look at my cartoons, and if you want to see what my cartoons look like, just go to dannelsonart.com, click on illustrations, and then click on the album. It's called Cartoons, and there's a couple of hundred cartoons on there, I think. And uh, I, in, in the course of being a cartoonist for many years, I had developed, of course, a style, as you can imagine. And I remember being influenced, say, by Charlie Brown, by Charles Schultz, as a, as a young child, as a young man, as a 10, 12, 14-year-old kid, really younger than that, honestly, as a 10-year-old, as a, uh, I remember noticing how Charles Schultz, for instance, drew Charlie Brown's mouth and how, how the, his marks, his lines were kind of wiggly. And so at age 10, I started s sort of being influenced by that. And so the, the, the mouths on my cartoon characters, which you can still see the you can still see that influence if you go to my website and look at my cartoons. The mouths were sort of wiggly. I don't know how to say that any better than that. And um, one time, I had at when I was a young, I started working professionally at age 18. As soon as I, as a freshman in college, I started working for the college I went to. Not a big gig, but it was, you know, I got to see my stuff in print as an 18, 19, 20 year old, a lot. And uh, one year they hired me to do some cartoons for some big event coming, some event on campus. The next year, I, I can't remember, either I was no longer there or they hired somebody cheaper. I don't, I don't remember the details, <laughs> but they hired somebody else to do the cartooning. And the person they hired had clearly been influenced by me and and uh, looked at my stuff and tried to emulate me. I won't say imitate, but emulate me like any sensible young artist would do. So in this case, you know, a 19-year-old uh, artist is quite a bit younger than a 20-year-old artist. Do you understand? At that stage of life. So they tried to copy my way of drawing the cartoon mouth. This is just for instance. I'm trying to describe the difference between like that kind of mark that I just made. Whoops, I'm off camera again. Sorry about that. The the intuitive free mark and the imitation copy of of those marks. So the the young person who followed me, I have no idea who it was, um, tried to imitate my style, and it did not go well. I don't know if they thought it did or not, but the 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 lines that they ended up with in their cartoon mouth was very contrived. It was like pre-planned and something pre-planned. Anyway, so all I'm trying to do here, and it got off on a long, crazy story. Sorry about that. Um, I had to do something while I was drawing anyway. Um, is, um, is the difference between a, a, like a premeditated mark. I do think this, this translates into a lot of, a lot of our artwork. A premeditated mark versus, again, versus, I didn't, did you see me just right then? Am I on camera? Yeah? Did you see me just go, I can do it slow motion like that? It took me about a little, maybe 1.3 seconds, I'm guessing, to do make that mark. I didn't think ahead of time. Okay, get ready, set. I'm going to make this curvy mark. It's going to go like this. If I had done that, it would have been fake, artificial, like, the smile that, you know, a younger artist tried to copy me and it just didn't work. But even if I copy me, it doesn't work. Anyway, I, I do think there is something about this, the freedom of um, Mark and as somebody, it seems to me like last time I said something like this, Jane, one of our, might have been Jane, but you are correct. Um, where does that, where does that freedom come from? Like to make that mark that again that I just did. Experience. Correct. So I'm I'm not diminishing that. That it, it indeed does come from experience. But 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 I think the value so I you can't start doing 
what I'm doing, like today, if this is your first exposure to the notion of, I'm going to call it involuntary marks. Spontaneous, unpremeditated is actually more accurate. If this is your first exposure, you, you can't simply say to yourself, oh, by golly, now I know the secret to good painting. It's making involuntary marks. And then you go and try it and it doesn't work well. Okay, so no, you can't take it like that. But there is some value, I contend, um, in somebody opening your mind, exposing you to this concept, which most people, I've never heard anybody else teach it. Doesn't. Oh man, somebody's at the door and I'm broadcasting. Okay, hang on. I guess it's a moxie guy. <laughs> Hello. Hey, how are you? Good. I'm you on good? microphone broadcasting, so make it quick. Gotcha. My name is Zach. I'm here for your termite inspection. Oh, okay. That's I right. I need to talk to you first. Do you really? I do. Darn it. Oh. You need permission to go into the house? No, I need to ask you some questions about the house. <laughs> um, okay. Darn it. My wife's not here. Can you talk to any other adult? I'm not sure there is another adult here. I don't think is he? Do you know where your mom or dad are? Well, I need to the owner. The owner? Do you want me to reschedule? <laughs> no. You, um, okay. Hang on. Okay, Kang. I, evidently, you heard that. I can't get out of this. So, I'll be back in a few minutes. Brief pause. Don't go away. I'll be back. Hello, Barbara. All right. Pause. Be All right, I am I am back. Let me get my ear back in. Whoops, I don't hear myself yet. Hopefully I'll hear myself shortly. Come on. All right. Saying hi. Oh, somebody just said Merrill Thomas. I don't know if you're still with us, Merrill. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for finding me. Musky asks, how many hours in this painting so far? Again, Musky, forgive me. I don't know if you're still with us. Um, <clears throat> how many hours? Um, stretch the canvas because <laughs> it's an unusual shape. That was an hour. Uh, putting a grid, another 45 minutes. Doing, doing the drawing on top of the grid, three hours. Really long process. Two, maybe. So let's call it two and a half. So then I've got four hours, say, total in it at that point. And then abstract, 10 minutes. <laughs> we won't count that. And then after the abstract, m m more drawing, another hour and a half. So that's maybe six, five and a half, five and a half hours. And then uh, this morning, an hour, six and a half. So let's say seven hours, six and a half or seven hours into it so far. Good question, which is pretty good for painting the size. All right, pretty fast, I mean, for painting the size, probably. <laughs> and Uncle asks, why are the buildings yellow and orange? Very much. It's a sunset evening. Sun is coming from almost straight behind me here, which is not a good way to do a photograph with the sun right behind you, but I'm going to exaggerate it slightly and turn the sun a little bit to the left. But it's definitely, and, and uh, my client, uh, sorry, it's partly blocked by my, there we go. Uh, this is the painting, a bad copy of the painting that this client found online. It said, can you do one like that for us? So that was my instruction, and that is definitely a twilight kind of painting. Good question. <laughs> I'm the only person who knows your name is Light Blue. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Lieutenant Blue. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, <laughs> and again, forgive me, I don't know if you guys are still with us. For Mike, Michael from Snowy Scotland. Oh, I'm envious. 
I mean, I know you're sick of snow probably by now, but man, what I wouldn't give for a trip to snowy Scotland. I would go freaking mad for all the visual stuff I'd be seeing. I know it. And I take it I answered your question, light blue. I'm using watercolor pencil and a black pencil. And Joker, can you repeat something you told me? But I don't have time to translate it. <laughs> uh, hello, Barbara. Um, um, uh, yeah, uh, light blue, thanks for asking. It was Lady Grammy. Thank you. That's right, Barbara gave the right answer. Wait. Who was it? Who gave me a? Yeah, it was it was Uncle. I, I got confused for a second there. All right, I'll be done reading these chats here in a minute. I do appreciate all the chats, and I'm sorry. Treadfall, thanks for speaking up. Um, he says I use the I use the term involuntary and random marks to my to my classes when people are trying to copy what I'm painting. Very good, exactly. That's exact. It's like almost untransferable, isn't it? Almost, and everybody's going to have their own their own marks. I mean, you can't do this and I can't do what you do. It's like fingerprint. We are so unique. That's my opinion. Part of the beauty of visual art is that every person is absolutely unique. We can copy, you know, like uh, years ago I copied a William Bouguereau, but um, oh my goodness, light blue sent me a hundred dollars. My goodness, I am humbled and grateful. Bless you, Light Blue. Thank you so much. Very kind of you. Not through Super Chat, but through something else, right? I'm, oh, no, there it is. It was through Super Chat. Well, thank you very much. Wow. Thank you, Light Blue. That's very generous of you. Um, Joker, good night. <laughs> Kazakhstan. <laughs> We're honored to have you with us. I am especially honored to have you with us. Thank you. Well, I'm glad I took time to, to read this carefully. My goodness. Um, light blue, again, you're exactly, you're, you're an art teacher, evidently, right? Yeah, it's okay to copy somebody, of course, but it's a season you go through. You, you know, you get influence, not copy. For, I've shared this before for, as an illustrator starting in 1983, maybe? I made Maxfield Parrish was my muse. Maxfield Parrish was my influencer. As an illustrator, you'd see some of his influence in my illustrations. Again, dandelsonart.com, go to illustration page and click on pen and ink illustrations. The color stuff there, Im imitation, influenced by um, Maxfield Parrish. You go through season. <laughs> yes, <laughs> confounded termites. All right. Well, I'm glad I thank you again, Light Blue. You're very, very kind and I appreciate it very much. Um, my wife appreciates it even more. <laughs> All right. Well, finally, let's get back to some, let's get back to drawing or painting as the case may be. I think I'm done with this now for a while. Get that out of the way. Um, okay, yeah, yeah, let's do. I started to talk yesterday, I realized. After I hung up, I started t laughing at myself and talking about um, having this fancy schmancy easel. And I got, I got talking about my trips to Paris, which I did not pay for and so on. See, a couple days ago, somebody accused me of being a rich person because I'd, <laughs> I'd been to Paris twice. <laughs> and uh, I just, you just don't know. You know, you just don't know somebody else's story until you know their story. So once again, that same person would think there's a little bit of envy in their tone. I think, <laughs> you know, it's, it's the current, current political trend to, to hate everybody that has something you don't have. <laughs> um, uh, but I do have, I have some <laughs> really fancy easels and I don't, I won't tell you the whole story right now. I think I've told it before, but um, I will tell you that I didn't pay for it. I didn't buy it. Um, it was given to me. They were all given to me. Again, the story belies normal. Like if you put it in a novel, 
it would, people would go, no, that, that doesn't happen, but it did. <laughs> so here I am <laughs> looking like a rich person with a big fancy schmancy electric easel and I didn't pay for them. No, I th I'm thankful, believe me. I I'm very thankful for, the, for them, but I didn't pay for them. And you do not need a fancy schmancy easel to do good paintings. That's really one of the things I really want to say. Easel schmeasel. It's in the skill, not in the machinery. <laughs> but it is nice to have. All right. <laughs> Let's get on to the next step in this painting, in this broadcast, which I have already mentioned to you. Is going, I mean, in the title there, is first of all drawing with pencils, which I'm declaring is now finished. Um, yeah, I want, to put, I want to put this photograph back up here. Let me look at um, so, uh, so corresponding very closely to the uh, drawing with pencils is drawing with now with dark paint, small brushes, skinny brushes, and um, dark transparent, of course. And as you know, if I say dark, it means transparent. I don't need to say dark transparent, but I say it just for any newcomers. Dark infers transparent. You, you get dark with transparent color and light with opaque. Not, not everybody knows that. Not everybody does that. Um, there are artists out there, I've said this before, I'll say it this way again, being very overly blunt. There are artists out there who are better than I am, more richer, more famous, or more better than me. It irritates the fire to me. <laughs> not because not because of not because of a, a healthy kind, a good kind of envy because I want to know what they know. Man, doggone it, I want to discover what, what have they learned that I haven't learned. And that's my job, to figure out what they know that I don't know. Um, okay, what I'm trying to say is there are artists out there who are better than I am, who do not follow this um, practice. That is, you get dark with transparent colors and light with opaque. Okay, so there are people who are better than me, but here's what I'm going. Here's what I'm, I'm going to have the gall, in a minute. Brace yourself, to say. But if in fact they did paint this way, that is dark with transparent, light with opaques. Especially the dark with transparent is the the key issue there they would be better than they are, which is, which is a pretty bodacious thing to say. I just want you to know I'm being bodacious. Um, how, how can I, a mere peon, a mere, you know, nobody in the art world, have the nerve to dare to in, give instruction to somebody, say, like one of my heroes, Richard Schmid. Who am I to give counsel to Richard Schmid? Well, you know, if, if you get old enough in life, you discover, oh, it's not me versus Richard Schmid. It is, say, Peter Paul Rubens, Rembrandt, Bouguereau, ad nauseum. Um, it's them versus Richard Schmid. Do you understand? So I'm not the only one who paints. Is that because my, my penchant, if you will, for painting... Um, under, for understanding this principle uh, is not unique to me by any means. This is the way all great painters painted bef essentially before 1890. Every great painter you know before 1890. Why 1890? Because 1890 is when, first of all, when roughly when the Impressionist Revolution came in, which we were okay with because we were still on the quest for beauty. And then with the quote-unquote modern art and here I'm using the term not as an academic, but as a man on the street, so to speak. Um, and then the quest was, in fact, no longer for beauty. And I'm not even against the, the revolution, per se, that took place. 
in, in that era, we, the, there were a number of things, uh, forces that conspired to, to make us go through the artistic temper tantrum of the 20th century. Uh, I would just like to advocate that we have learned those lessons and the temper tantrum should be over. But the fact is, it was more than just a visual temper tantrum that was going up, that was sweeping through uh, the, the art world of, of the 19th, of the 20th century. Um, it was in fact a philosophical and worldview temper tantrum that was, that was sweeping. And that's why uh, we abandoned the pursuit of beauty uh, and I might, I'm going to leave this topic dangling here any, any second here. I'm not going to continue because I don't have the energy for it right now. And partly I don't want to alienate some of you. And I, so I'm not mad at any of those modern artists. I'm, I, I can get mad at, at, at um, Clement Greenberg and company. He was mad at everybody, so to get mad at him is sort of just like <laughs> turn around his fair play. But he was not an artist; he was a critic. But uh, and I can be deeply disappointed in in most of the university art professors in the Western world today, and, and indeed I am, because again, they they are not pursuing beauty, which it's their prerogative to not pursue beauty. But most of them do not know what they what they're actually doing philosophically. They're they're actually just sheep doing you know what their professors told them to do. Um, oh boy, somebody's going to get triggered and mad at me. <laughs> and you're going to say, "Aren't you just doing what your professors told you to do?" And I would I would say, my resume speaks for itself. Um, no, I'm I'm a I'm an authentic creative. There are a number of things in my literal resume that say things like, only person in America that does this, that, and thus and so. And again, if I started elucidating them, you'd say, doggone, this guy is arrogant. So I've already bordering on arrogant enough, but my resume speaks for itself. I'm a, I'm a true creative innovator. I'm a true innovator. Anyway, now what does all have to do with anything? Um, It had, it came out of somewhere. Now I've forgotten where I was going with that, but it doesn't matter. Probably just as well. <laughs> ADD, squirrel. <laughs> now there was some bigger point I started to make and I really wish I could remember what it was. But I can't, honestly, right now. Oh, dark versus light. That's right. That's right. That's right. Dark uh, with transparent. That, that's what I mean to say. And, and I'm, I was defending my thesis that even artists, I use another name. Uh, one of my, again, one of the men, men that I like personally. And, and he doesn't know me, but I've been in his presence, you know, several times when he was teaching and demoing and so forth. Kevin McPherson, you know, big dog, big, you know, maybe the most famous a uh, plain air painter in America, maybe, and fabulous work, but he doesn't do the transparent. As far as I know, as far as I know, let me say that. And he might have real good reasons for not doing it, but again, I think if he painted the way he does, but with a slice of Rembrandt on the side, and by Rembrandt, I mean dark, get dark with transparents, not with opaques. And by the way, I, I I think he probably does this to a significant degree already. But uh, my, my thesis is that I'm not so arrogant to think that I have the right to instruct somebody of the, the stature of a Kevin McPherson. But I, I will stand by my stuff to the, to the degree of saying that, yeah, but even Kevin would be better than he is, so to speak, if he, if he moved toward in a Rembrandtish direction. That, okay, I probably probably talked about that way too much there. So in the edited version, which there will never be, you understand. <laughs> in the edited version, I would edit the whole last 20 minutes out of this video. <laughs> I'm 
<laughs> Such are the hazards, eh? Such are the hazards of um, <laughs> live broadcasting. <laughs> you know what? This building looks like it's leaning over to me. That, that disturbs me greatly. And if I had my T-square here, alas, I don't think I do it. It's upstairs. I won't interrupt you guys to run and go get it, but I will slap a T-square up against that building just, just to make sure. Usually, it's not just my imagination. There'll be some mark in, in the midst of that, or some marks, plural, some marks that need to be rectified a little bit. Oh, yes, that irritates me. What do you think? Yeah, that's not, not happy. All right, let me talk about what I've been doing besides jabbering <laughs> for the last 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> I've got to go pick up the kids from school. Um, Uncle, I have not gone back to Krispy Kreme to paint lately, but it's I'm due for another one because I think, I believe, even though I've painted it I, maybe eight times already, I think all eight of them have sold, maybe nine, I don't know. So yeah, time for me to go back. Was that you were saying something about inspection? Oh, no, 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 you're asking, I'm sorry, you're asking about my, the mural. Uh, no, it, thank you for asking. Good question. It is on my calendar. I've been in touch with the owner and I, I said, let's, let's let the, the ravages of, of cold weather do their worst. Thank you. I'm glad I stuck with it to see what you're actually saying. Um, and it's on, on my calendar sometime in March to go visit. The last time I visited, they were concerned, uh, but when I got there, I was not concerned. So I'm not nearly as worried as, at, as I was when I first heard back from them. Um, I think what they're experiencing is simple uh, contraction and expansion between um, hardy plank or hardy board siding uh, that, that uh, the painting is on. And there's a, one sheet of canvas that goes across, so if I remember right, several layers of uh, hardy plank. Is that right? No, it was not a paint. That, no, there's no canvas. Anyway, um, I, I'm not too worried about it, but I hope, I hope my optimism is, proves um, rewarded. No, sometime in March, thanks for asking. Sometime in March, I'm supposed to go back and look at my Krispy Kreme mural. This method of painting trees, I, I talk a lot about painting trees, of course, I do it a lot. And, and one of the th descriptions I have is to make, don't paint one branch at a time, make tree-like marks. And of course, two hands, it helps a great deal because it's twice as fast. Um, and I don't know if you can tell that I'm twirling these brushes as I, as I make those branchy marks. And none of those, the marks that I just made, none of them are the final mark. Let me go ahead and scratch through some of them, by the way. Because, of course, I have the entire uh, final edit layer to go yet ahead of me, right? So, which is the slowest, the longest and slowest, the most meticulous of my, my layers, it's the final edit. And it's not the final layer anymore. It used to be, but it's not anymore. After final edit, now I typically do broken color, broken and pushed color to be more precise, and then sparkle, and then somewhere in there, either before or after that, um, a final glaze, one more in glaze over the entire painting of whatever colors I want, different different colors not by the singular glaze I don't mean I don't mean to infer 
that it's all one color. No, it's all different colors. Okay. Uh, the, the current step that I'm working on right now, um, which is drawing with dark trans in, in dark transparent details, uh, one of my objectives at, in, at this stage is to make sure that I have adequate darks in the painting. Okay, this is officially, not, I can cheat, of course, but this is officially the last uh, dark layer of the painting process. From now on, it's all light. So the painting is slightly, the overall cast of the canvas is slightly darker than, than it, the finished painting will be. And that's right where I want to be. Because final edit is, is what? Final edit is light, opaque highlights and um, and uh, likewise the uh, sparkle tends to be more light than dark areas. No, 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 I said that wrong. Sparkle is always light. What I meant to say was broken color. The broken color layer is uh, generally light. Anyway, so the painting's a little bit darker than the finished painting will be. Again, which is right right about where I want it. The, this uh, skyline view of our city, which is Raleigh, North Carolina, which is where I live, um, the view is taken from a hill outside of town called Dix Hill, D-I-X, Dix Hill, which is where our state hospital was located for a hundred years. And it has now vacated that property and the city has bought it, it's turning it into all kinds of parks and so forth. Um, kind of exciting to me as an artist. I was always for that. There was a lot of debate, as you can imagine. The city's paying, what, $50 million a year for I don't know how long, maybe it's 50 million period, I don't know, but they're paying a lot of money for it. And of course, there's always people who say you shouldn't, you shouldn't be spending the money like that for things like that. I'm too dumb to get into those. No, I don't, I don't want to get into those arguments, frankly. There's people smarter than me, hopefully, making those decisions. There was something, oh, and there's a, a footpath, a trail, that goes right along here, which is a significant element in the in the scene, a paved path. Our city does has done a really good job, especially in the last 20 years, I guess I'd say, a really good job of, of greenway and trails. You can get almost anywhere on on by bicycle uh, in the city on these trails, quite pleasant. One comes near our house. Um, I've only, I'm, I'm woefully behind in riding it, but I hope to rectify that shortly, this spring, maybe. More bear trees. You can kind of tell I like painting bear trees. <laughs> And again, what I'm showing you here, whoops, let's, is, uh, is uh, a method for painting or drawing trees, as opposed to, you know, tongue painting each branch. If you use that method, you better have the patience of Job, as the expression goes, or the, the patience of Bob Timberlake. Google him if you don't know who he is. He's a famous North Carolina, old Carolina artist. Still alive, but you know, one of our famous artists who does super tight realism, and uh, he must spend literally he must spend weeks painting leaves, which is not what I'm going to do. Um, so instead of tongue painting one branch at a time, you just train your hands 
take some track practice, of course, but it's what you see me doing. Train your hands to make, if, if you will, tree-like marks. And then you can make them, you can make them very quickly. Uh, and so it doesn't take hours and hours and hours to get the feeling of a tree. Now, of course, all of my painting is done in layers and layers and layers. So what, what you see me doing when I'm doing those branches is not the last word, right? I'm going to come back and do, of course, light in between those branches, which will make it look considerably more realistic. Right at the moment, I'm just doing a little bit of dark. Again, one of my objectives in this dark drawing phase one of my objectives is to accomplish or reach adequate darkness. Okay, I usually use the, I often use the expression, where's my, where are my eight, nine, ten? Where's my eight, nine, tens? Okay, there actually will not be any tens in, in, you know what I mean by that? Uh, number ten value is like black, 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 black velvet. <laughs> Elvis, Elvis on, Elvis on velvet, that's number 10. There won't be any, literally any tens in a painting like this. Tens do, certainly do not appear in, really, in nature, since when does that stop me though, right? Um, but I do want, I do want adequate darks. Me, me myself, um, I do want um, a fairly robust range of values. So I would use, on a painting like this in the landscape, I might use the term almost 10, which of course just means nine, but we won't get fussy. <laughs> so right at the moment, I'm just, again, just want to make sure, I, I can cheat, of course. I can, I can come back and in the later, after the final edit, I go, oh, you know what? Or during the final edit is when it usually happens. I might go, oh, you know what? I need some darkness in here, so I can do that, but I'd rather not. I'd rather achieve adequate or sufficient dark values um, right now. So that's what I'm doing right now. Um, one of the things, I've, I just mentioned this again just recently, like last week, one of the things that I have always liked about my basic approach to painting, I've gone through a lot of evolution, as you know, over the last 15, coming up on 16 years. But one thing has always been constant, and that is, is what I've been talking about. You get darks with by layers of transparent paint. And again, compared to other artists that I see, it, it, I, this is one of the things that I really do like about my approach, and that is that the darks in my paintings, mid-tones as well, but the darks are, they're dark, but they're full of energy. Unlike, unlike a, a lot of people's darks are devoid of it. They're a black hole. They're, they're devoid of energy. But because I, I achieve my dark values by applying layers and, and this is what, tragically, what you guys, you can, you really can't see. I mean, you're getting more glare over here than anything because of the windows behind me. Um, but here in person, what looks on your camera, on your monitor, I presume to be quite blackish here in, in real life. It does look dark, but you peer into it and you see layers, all these layers of uh, color coming through, which of course, it was achieved by layers, first of all, layers of acrylic, transparent acrylic, and then on top of that, layers of transparent oil. So it's a very, a very rich, dark, my darks are very rich, and I've always liked that. And the same thing is true of my mid-tones. It's only the, the light stuff that will be, of course, opaque, like Kevin McPherson's, so, like everybody else's which will be the same, if you will, uh, uh, as far as the quality of the, the color. All right, so I, I 
No, I'm just about dark enough. I, I still have probably, after the final edit, I'll probably do one more layer of glaze so I actually can get these, these bits um, even darker if I determine that that's what's needed. Give me a minute to clean my brushes. All right, and even though I didn't label this broadcast, I, I've just done what I labeled it, drawing with pencils, the drawing with brushes. But I'll go ahead and get started, just get started. Um, Um, I'm going to start final edit. Um, and let me, so, final edit is light. So I'm going to, for the first time, I'm going to um, put up some titanium white on my palette. Now there was some, there was some white, of course, back in the acrylic phase, the acrylic stage, but mostly it was transparent white, not, not colored, mostly. Um, so this is really essentially the first time where I'm going to paint, like at most oil painters, that is titanium white mixed with blank to make a light color. And I can start anywhere. The, the most, here's where I typically start. Either the furthermost object, which of course in the landscape is always the sky. Option number one, start with the sky. Option number two, start with the lightest, brightest, whitest, lightest thing in the scene, which in this case, the top of this building or the, the sunward side, this building right here, the buildings in our, in our city that really are, truly are white, so they're picking up a lot of brightness. That's option number two. Or option number three, it just start at a focal point. Which would, from, which would be just right in here somewhere. So let me think about that for a minute. That's most typical. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to start somewhere in these buildings. Again, probably on the light side. I won't do an awful lot on the shady side of these buildings. Not much. Hang on a second, I wanna... There's a building here that's bothering me a little bit. Yeah, okay, hang on, just one quick, quick touch up before I go to final edit. I want this one building to be a little darker and a little more orange on the on the shady side right here. I don't know why it wasn't, but that's bothering me. Not quite enough dimension in that particular building. Now I'm just fiddling since I've got this on my brush, you know? Why not? <laughs> All right, good enough. And where to start, very intuitive. Um, by, by no means claim consistency. for a brush that calls my name. Not seeing it yet. Oh, there's one, but it's a little bit stiff, wouldn't you know? Ah, it's good enough. I got it. I got it unstiff. Good enough. All right. I do typically use uh, a different brush in each hand. I don't use the same size. So this is a Pro Stroke, one of Jerry's brands, flat or bright. No, it's a flat, I think. And a, oh, and a something else. Oh, another pro stroke. How about that? Um, Filbert. I use more Filberts for what it's worth. More Filberts than anything else, but you do not need to copy me in that. That's just, that's just me. By no means is it the magic formula. Trying 
need to get the right shade of everything. Let's bring this down a little bit. How's my camera? Is it pointing in the right direction? Yeah, more or less. For what it's worth, by the way, electric easel is, is not my favorite. Um, I have another large easel, Sanya easel. It used to be made by Jerry Sardaram, and I think they've discontinued the series, which those things happen. Um, I have one that has counter, the one I typically use outdoors, uh, essentially the same size as this one, but it has weights, steel plates, or iron plates that you stack up and a cable that, so you can raise or lower the, the easel very quickly with a finger. No more, no more strength needed than one finger. And I like, I actually like that noticeably more than, than this electric motor one. This is slow. So you would think that, ooh, the, the electric version would be the fancy schmancy favorite, but it's actually not. All right, so I'm assuming you can see a little bit. I'll zoom in for a while. Tell you what, let me move you guys your camera so that hopefully when I, I'll, I'll get you pointed the right direction. If I, if I move the tripod so it's in my way, then I'm more likely to remember to move it when I'm no longer painting right in this area. That's about as zoomed in as I can get without getting crazy. I do like students to be able to see me do the final edit phase. Because on one hand, starting now with what I call the final edit, I'm painting like an ordinary uh, contemporary painter. That is to say I'm painting in daubs of um, opaque paint. Okay, so I'm painting like ordinary. But on the other hand, I'm not painting like ordinary because my quest, well, this makes sense, think about it a little bit, my quest is to retain as much of the underpainting, let as much of the underpainting show through as possible. I just bumped you, are you okay? Yeah, I think so. So when I am teaching this technique, um, this is where my students, if they've followed to me carefully, studiously up to this point, when they get to this point, in fact, the, the final edit layer is typically where they blow it. <laughs> Even though, in spite of all my protestations and warnings to the contrary, the reason I think they, this is where, if you're, and if so this, anybody that's gonna wants to imitate me for a while, this is where you need to be careful. This is where the imitation really gets critical. You let, you allow as much of the underpainting, really, for those of you who are just starting, way more than you're comfortable with. I'll continue to let the underpainting show through. Now, the, the word that I usually use is do not plaster, which is, again, how I would describe most painters of my generation. They plaster thick, opaque paint on, on their paintings. So I am against that because because transparent colors are more interesting than opaque colors. And right at the moment, I'm painting with opaque colors. So does that make sense? Opaque is not as pretty as transparent. Right now I'm painting with opaque, therefore, it is my goal to not plaster, but to allow as much of the transparent underpainting to show through as so to speak, as I can stand, okay? <laughs> to 
put it in a funny way. So, am I, yeah, I'm still on camera. So let's take this, this plane, this side of a, a building. Here's the, the building goes over here, this, what is that dark thing? Oh, that's a shadow. Okay, then let me, here, I'm gonna do some. So here's, I haven't done the sunny side, but there's the sunny side of the building. Here's the shadow side of the building. Let's just look at the shadow side for a minute. And it's, it's, it's a building that's got a, a knob on the top of it, okay? As, as soon as it reads like the building that it is, then I don't need to do any more. There are, and I'm assuming if you look carefully, you can see there's all kinds of um, extraneous abstract marks on the shady side of this building they're painting right now, right? It's just, it, and partly because the color that I'm putting on right now, even though I'm calling it opaque, it's actually, it's ostensibly opaque. It's literally translucent. So we're seeing through it, but there's green, red, blue, yellow undertones. But it reads in its current state, it looks like a building, I'm going back to pencil here for a minute. In fact, not only does it look like a building, when I look at the photograph, I can say, oh yeah, it, it looks like the building. And that, that, means, that means I don't need to do any more work to it, even though you can see I am doing more work, right? I'm almost finished though. So the, so there's a lot of the underpainting is still showing literally through the paint that I just put on top. Okay, I'm going to, before I leave this building, I'm going to do the, the thing that I do almost always once we enter the opaque phase of painting, which again, for me is the, just the last um, stages. Um, that is, after having put down this color, kind of a brownish orange, right? Then I mix up a slightly lighter version. So I just mixed some titanium white. And here and there, I put it down on top of the color that I just put down. Okay, now that's a really good tip, by the way. This is one of those tricks. If you'll file away this trick, this trick almost always works, almost always looks good. And there really aren't that many things in painting and visual art that you can say almost always works. But I will, I'll, I'll put my name on this one, so to speak. I'll stand by this one. So there's just, I use the word sparkle. Um, it still reads like a flat plane. But there's a little bit of iridescence or color variation going on there that is quite pleasant. And one more, one more mark. I'm going to call that good enough. All right. So that's, I'm done with that building, almost certainly. But while I've got this color on my brushes, so I don't have to I'll add a little bit of yellow to it, so I don't have to clean my brushes, waste time or waste paint, cleaning my brushes. Let's go to a, another building in this vicinity that's of a similar hue, shall we say. And yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the photograph that's above me here. I'm looking at it, um, you know, fairly carefully. I'm certainly not a slave to it, but um, my objective is to is to represent that building fairly accurately. I want you know members, residents of my fair city, to look at this painting and go, "Oh yeah, that's that's Raleigh." All right. So, by the way, did you see my brush shaking there? 
I hope you did. It's there. It was shaking again. In fact, anytime if I just hold here, I'm just I'm not going to paint. I'm just going to hold it up there. Sort of as still as I can. I've never done this before. This is a good good. Do you see how much it's moving? I, I talk about this subject often, but I just don't usually do it this way. Do you see how much my brushes are wiggling? All right, I want to make a very important point for anybody watching who, if you're an early journey painter, if you're more beginner than me, <laughs> than I, I know you English majors, quiet. <laughs> If you're more beginner than me, I want you to know, because I know how most early journey painters, because I were one once, I know how they feel about their wiggly hands and shaking fingers and shaking brushes, brushes that won't hold still. Most early journey painters are angry at their hands because they won't hold still. Are you still listening? Not done yet. That's why most early journey painters will, of course, pick up a much smaller brush, let's say <laughs> something like this, <laughs> and a mall stick. I actually have a real mall stick over here. And they'll switch to their death control grip and they'll stick out their tongue and they'll go because they feel like they have control. Indeed, they, indeed, they do have control. That's why I call it the death control grip death to your painting. Anyway, let me go back to the, the, our wiggly, jiggly hands. Please do not be angry at your hand. You are not doing anything wrong. In fact, the reason your hand is shaking is because you be alive. <laughs> Don't worry. One day, <laughs> let's be funny and macabre here to make the point. Don't worry. One of these days, sooner than you think, your hand will stop shaking. <laughs> and you will indeed, you won't draw straight lines. Oh no, my friend. You will draw a flat line. Boom! <laughs> okay. My little macabre humor there. Same to me, absolutely. Let's not, let us not lose touch with the fact that we're all going out of this world one way, either being flash of, a flash of uh, um, light, <laughs> if we're incinerated, or feet first into a box. Well, we're all going the same way. Um, anyway, that's when, you will, that's when your hand will stop wiggling. So please don't wish for hands that stop wiggling, okay? I'm being a little bit facetious here, but I'm also trying to make a point. Stop wishing for hands that stop shaking. The reason your hand shakes is because your heart is beating. You have a pulse. Enjoy it. The day will come when you won't have a pulse anymore. So stop being angry at your hand. Um, and I'm, again, of course, you know I'm playing with you a little bit. But early journey painters think that something's wrong with them because their hand shakes. And indeed, nothing is wrong with your hand. It's that you, the fact is you have a pulse. That's why your hand shakes. And more than that, so stay away from that death control grip stuff. Um, you, I say all the time, have said for years. Okay, by the way, let me, let me tell you what I'm doing. I just painted the, the light side of three buildings. This one, this one, and this one. Let me do one more. I've been saying for years that... Um, the essence of good painting is making interesting marks. Okay? Right? Register? Yes. And the essence of good marks is variety. And in fact, those little wiggles and jiggles that your hands are doing is your hand trying to help you be a good painter by making interesting marks. And again, so many people retreat because they're, they don't like that because they're control freaks. They think that good painting lies in the direction, lies down the path of accuracy, tightness, and realism. Okay, we, we beat that thing to death. Anyway, it does not. 
So anyway, um, the little wiggles that your hand is doing is your hand trying to make you a good painter by making you create interesting marks. Good. Everything I'm saying now only makes sense to those of you who have crossed the river, <laughs> the boundary from first half of art journey to second half art journey. And that's not all of you. So if everything I'm saying is like, doesn't make any sense. Well, thank you for being on our, on our broadcast. Thanks for being on your journey. But if, if it doesn't make sense, it's because you're still in the first half of your journey, which is totally fine. In fact, it's wonderful to be on the first half of your journey. But once you get into the second half of your art journey, you come to realize that the picture is just a thinly veiled excuse for if making interesting marks is one way to put it. All right. So don't fight against your wiggly jiggly hands. That is your hands making you a real artist. Now, I began to develop this opinion long before I understood it or embraced it. Um, but uh, I remember, clearly remember in art history classes way back in the middle of the last millennium, <laughs> last century almost anyway. <laughs> of course, you have to understand there wasn't nearly as much art history back when I was studying it. <laughs> That's an old joke my dad used to say all the time. Back when he was a kid, there wasn't much history. <laughs> um, anyway, I remember clearly looking at slides, especially of Rembrandt, and anybody could see. They would show us, they would show us slides of his paintings early in his career, and then show us slides, literal slides back in these days, of course, um, slides of his uh, later paintings. And first of all, the, even I, even though I, I was very much in the throes of my early art journey and I was trying to paint stuff that looked like stuff, that was my, one of my highest values was to paint stuff that looked like stuff. But even I had to admit that his later stuff was better than his early stuff. And his later stuff was all considerably messier than his late stuff. And at the time I thought, well, sure, that's just because he was an, turned into an old man and he had bad eyesight and his hands were shaking. Well, now that I am an old man, guess what I think? Exactly the same thing. <laughs> that all those artists, all of them, they got more abstract as they aged because their eyes went bad and their hands shook. Be that as it may, which it does, it does be, <laughs> their, their, um, later paintings were better than the early ones. Because again, because they had crossed this bridge from trying to paint stuff that looks like stuff, which even Rembrandt did. He'd gone from painting stuff that looks like stuff to painting stuff that looks like paint. The abstract elements of design are paramount over the picture. Now, as you can tell, the picture is important. You can tell by looking at my painting that I'm I mean, if you had to describe, you know, is, is he an abstract painter or a realist painter? Well, oh, he's a realist painter, right? Having said that, however, it's also pretty obvious that there's something else at work because if my, if my goal, if my objective is realism, then, I'm, <laughs> then why do you explain all the crazy messiness in there? All right, so I'm rambling. Enough, yay, verily, I'm rambling too much, so let's just stop. And, and I think I'll, think I'll actually stop this broadcast here. Um, and I, I think I'll broadcast again later um, this afternoon. I hope I will, but if I don't, I hope you have a great weekend. Um, any chats I absolutely need to, to look at? Let me, let me turn on my... Uh, my live chat because I think it might have frozen up on me. No, I guess we're okay. Uh, Uncle, I don't know if you're asking me that question because I think, you know, dark's first, light's last. So what I'm doing right now is the light last phase. And I think you know that and I'm not sure. That chat's been there for a while, so I'm not sure if it's still up to date. So I've been specializing so far 
mostly on the light side of these buildings, which is really the, 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 the focal point. I don't know if it's the focal zone, it's hardly a focal point, but this, this whole area is really, and, and I'll probably, after doing a little bit more of that, I'm gonna launch into the sky But I think I'll, and I'm going to run upstairs and get a T-square to make sure that building is truly vertical. And I thank you again for your company. And thank you, Light Blue, for your generous, generous gift. And uh, thank you, Uncle 60, for your likewise generous gift. I appreciate it, you guys, very much. All right. Hope, again, if I don't see you again later, hope you have a good weekend. Bye-bye.